Hey, welcome back to the Handy Randy Show. We're continuing on with our saga of orphan cars and the wonderful orphan car show that's held each year in Ypsilanti, Michigan. Now, a lot of folks from Ohio don't care much for Michigan. And you know why? It all started over a border war. Michigan wanted to annex or felt that the uh, Toledo area should belong to them. And there was actually gunfighting and rifle fighting over that piece of land. And quite frankly, if you've been in Toledo, a lot of people say, you know what, go ahead and give it to Michigan. Those people in Toledo are Detroit Lions and Tigers fans. Well, anyway, that's a little history. Border war with Michigan started the rivalry many, many moons ago. So we're over it now, and we travel to Michigan, Michigan quite often because there's so many great museums and car shows because the industry more or less started in Detroit. So let's go back up to Ypsilanti. I know, I know, I know. More cars, less Randy. That's right, the second only to uh, 1937. We finally got her running, boys. Let's see what we got here. This is a 46, guys. It's a four-door touring sedan. This is Ben and Gene Harwood from New Boston, Michigan. This Deluxe Clipper model, according to the uh, script on the side. This one's a 48 Packard uh, Super 8. This is a four-door sedan. This is George Foley from Troy, Michigan. Yeah, the, the, the 46 Clipper there, you can see the, the, the fender fading into the door. Uh, that was quite advanced for mid-1941. It was a, a, was a style designed by Howard Darren, uh, an independent um, um, automotive designer. And this is, uh, the uh, problem was that the, the, the design, while well, it was very advanced, came in the middle of 1941, and because of the early end of production in, for 1942 cars in January, Packard really wasn't able to capitalize on their on that uh, quite good looking car and modernization of the Packard theme. This is a 48 Packard Custom 8. This is Alan Suget from Ann Arbor, Michigan. And for those of you that are interested in the Packard, this happens to be for sale. It's a 59,000 mile original car for $8,000. This is uh, an orphan car show committee member. Dan, pronounce your last name for me. Fame. This is Dan Beam from New Boston, Michigan. Dan is one of the several army of volunteers that work with us starting in September to put the show together every year. Go ahead and move ahead, Dan. This is a 49 Packard. This is a four-door sedan. This is John Porter from St. Clair, Michigan. I understand this is an original unrestored car. Is that right? Something we really like to see at any car show, an original unrestored car. That including the paint, sir? It's been partially repainted. Okay. Hmm. And you'll notice this car is slightly different than the other 49. This is the golden anniversary model. Came out in May of that year. It has a different body side molding and has larger uh, chrome housed headlamps, looks, or tail lamps. This is a 50. This is a four-door uh, Deluxe 8. This is Mark and Rhonda Gelstein from White Lake, Michigan. It looks like a 49. <laughs> the Packards were actually sold by series number rather than model year, although they had to title them by years. But Packard uh, numbered them starting with the original straight eights in 1924. This first one's a 53 Packard Clipper, two-door Sportster. This is Leonard Gregory from Lambertville. The uh, Packard Sportster was kind of an interim model. They only built it two years in 53 and 54, uh, the end of the straight eight series. And they already had come out with a hard top, but there was still a very conservative element within Packard. And so they decided to do something some of the other manufacturers had done, and that was take their two-door sedan and trim it up with a very deluxe interior, which is a full vinyl interior uh, and very wearable, but also very sharp. So they kind of sharpened up a lower-priced car and found a very limited market, but at that time they were striving to uh, 
regain marketplace and this is relatively a good success in getting people into the showroom. This next one, uh, Bill, is a 51 Packer, 200. This is a four-door deluxe sedan. This is Bill O'Grady from Carlton, Michigan. And this beautiful convertible is a 53. Absolutely gorgeous. This is a Matador Maroon Packard Caribbean, and this is owned by P.N. Hayden from Ann Arbor, Michigan. Uh, Dr. Hayden's been here many, many times over the years for the Orphan Car Show, a very big supporter of our show, and we appreciate it. Yeah, the uh, Packard Caribbean was, uh, there was a spate of uh, sort of specialty cars being introduced in 1953 and 54. Uh, the Chevrolet Corvette, the Buick Skylark, the Cadillac Eldorado, the Oldsmobile Fiesta, uh, the, um, the Kaiser Darren, other cars like that. This was Packard's version of an ultra luxury convertible. Uh, they only built 750 of these vehicles. It was sort of roughly patterned down after the Packard Pan American uh, show vehicle, which was designed by Richard Arbib. And um, uh, this was uh, an attempt by Packard to do a very glamorous convertible. And you can see the uh, very clean body sides. You can see the, uh, the chrome trim, full wheel openings, unlike the 54. And up front, you can see the, 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 what remains of the Packard yoke radiator grill, how they attempted to keep the, 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 the hallmark of the yoke radiator grill, but still adapted to modern uh, design. Uh, this is a 56 Packard 400 two-door hardtop. This is Doug and Karen Markham from Livonia, Michigan. This was the last of the big Packards, the big Detroit-built Packards, the production of which ended in June of 1956. Uh, this, uh, this car was designed by Dick Teague, who later wanted to be uh, vice president of design for American Motors. Um, this, is, this is the Packard that has the big, the big V8 introduced in 1955 and the torsion bar suspension, the cathedral tail lights that Dick Teague sketched up over Easter weekend in 1954 to get them on the 55 car. Um, Packard made a real valiant effort in 1955 and 1956 to pull equal to Lincoln and Cadillac and Imperial, but unfortunately uh, they ran out of money and the great Packard engineering staff was disbanded, many of them going to four. Hey, welcome back to Handy Randy. That contraption in front of you is an electric fuel pump. It's located in the bottom part of the gas tank. It has a sock or filter on the bottom end, the electric pump, and then the sump or the, the connection that runs over to the fuel lines that hook here and here. Now, this thing loves to be surrounded by gasoline. Um, gasoline is a lubricant uh, for the electric pump and also cools the electric pump. When you run your car on empty, who does that? You do, mm -hmm. and you, and you, and you and you. Tell the truth, you do too. When you run your car on empty, the electric pump has no cooling, no lubrication, and they cost hundreds of dollars to replace. So, handy randy rule, never run on empty, or try not to. Pretend half is empty from this point forward to protect that valuable piece of equipment in the bottom of your fuel pump. Cool? Good. Glad you were listening. Now, we're going to go back up to Ypsilanti, and I promise you, none of those vehicles have electric fuel pumps in the bottom of their gas tanks. Promise. Let's go back up there. This one here is a 58 Packard Hawk two-door hardtop. This is Don Berg from Platteville, Wisconsin. Uh, when Studebaker and Packard merged in 1954, um, again, the company got into trouble. There was a um, there was a deal with Curtis Wright Company in the, in the summer of 1956 that rescued Studebaker Packard, but at the price of ending Packard production in Detroit. Um, so Packard's began, they were built in South Bend on Studebaker chassis during 1957 and 58. Uh, there was a man named Roy Hurley who was president of Curtis Wright, and he persuaded the uh, Studebaker Packard uh, styling staff to make up a, a car for him, and this car later went into production as the Packard Hawk. Uh, it's a variation of the famous Studebaker Hawk, and of course this is the same, roughly the same body as was used on the 1953 uh, Studebakers. Uh, the Packard Hawks are very rare, um, and uh, we're really privileged to see one here today. Okay, this is a 1925 Oakland. This is a Landau Coupe. 
This is Gary McIntyre from Brighton, Michigan, and we are now in our second classifications of cars, which are orphans of the big three. Gentlemen, the Oakland Company was one of the original companies of General Motors when it was founded, put together by William C. Durant in 1908. Um, uh, Oakland, uh, in 1926, introduced a companion car called the Pontiac, which uh, quickly um, quickly became a much more favored car by the buying public than the Oakland, and the Oakland was uh, discontinued after the 1931 models. This is a beauty. This is a 1940, and this is a uh, convertible Packard. This is Howard and Norma Weaver. Uh, the LaSalle, of course, was a very lovely car. This is the last of the series in 1940. It was a 1941 model planned, and it was um, actual uh, some wood models, wood mock-ups were made, but um, Cadillac at the last minute decided not to continue with the LaSalle and come out with a uh, lower-priced Cadillac in 1941, which was, from a marketing standpoint, the right thing to do because Cadillac sales just about doubled in 1941. This is a 57 Monarch Turnpike Cruiser, which of course very similarly resembles the Mercury Turnpike Cruiser here in America. This is Harry Robertson from Richmond, British Columbia, and I understand you're going to have this car at the Ford 100th anniversary celebration. It's gorgeous, Harry. This next one is a 1960 Monarch. Don't pull ahead, Harry. Just leave it there for a second. This is a 60 Monarch Lucerne. This is a two-door hardtop, which of course is very similar to our Mercury version in America. This is Joe Romanowski of Windsor, Ontario, Canada. Joe, it's gorgeous. Now you might ask, why did Ford make Mercuries and Monarchs? Well, it was the way they had decided to market in Canada. They had two dealer arms, Ford dealers and Mercury dealers. Well, because of the uh, economy in Canada, the Mercury dealers had to have a lower priced car and that was for the most time, most of the time known as a Meteor and then the Ford dealers needed a more expensive car and that was what became the Monarch and the Monarch was built between 1946 and 1961 and Jeff's going to take a few minutes to talk about the styling of these cars. The, um, the 1957 Monarch was probably the least different from the American Mercury because of the, the styling on the Mercury's that year was so distinctive that there was, uh, there was very little the designers could do to, to attempt to disguise it in any way. Uh, the 1960 model, you'll notice the individual grill, which is a, which is a, 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 um, a convex design, where I believe the Mercury was a concave design that year. And notice the individual trim on the rear fenders and the, and the different tail lights. Um, this is also, you'll notice that Monarchs usually carried a profusion of crowns. You'll see them on the, uh, on the key lock cylinders and on the, in the, on the fender ornaments and that kind of thing. This, of course, is Bob Elka. Bob has a 37 LaSalle Sport Coupe. LaSalle's can be broken, broken down in two classes. The first, the LaSalle, is from 27 to 33, and then the latter group from 34 to 40. Um, uh, LaSalle's, uh, LaSalle was interested as a companion car to the Cadillac to fill the price void between the Buick and the Cadillac, but it gradually grew in size, and uh, they weren't sure what to do with the vehicle. It was going to be discontinued after 1933 when supposedly uh, Harley Earl uh, had, a, had, had, a, had a model constructed, and then he uh, at a show before General Motors executives supposedly pulled the curtain and said, gentlemen, this is the car you're, eventually, uh, you're apparently not going to make. And of course, uh, they liked the car so much that they did decide to continue to sell uh, with its um, with, a, with a more modest uh, power plant at a more modest price. And the 34 through 40 LaSalles were again uh, very handsome cars. You can see the beautiful detailing on this car. Notice the individual LaSalle lettering on the on the, on the hood. Beautifully detailed car. But again, uh, Cadillac decided to uh, eventually to build all their cars under the Cadillac. Hey, welcome back to Handy Randy. That thing in front of you is a catalytic converter, sometimes called a Cadillac converter, which is not correct. It's an integral part of the emission system on all auto automobiles. Since about, mm, boy, the mid-70s, they've been using catalytic converters. It's very expensive. Here's the good part. It's guaranteed for seven years on your new automobile and or uh, depending on the, on the mileage, um, maybe 100,000 miles or so. So if someone tells you your catalytic converter is failing, check 
you know, the mileage, check your owner's manual, and you may find out that it's covered under your new car warranty. Call your dealership and you'll find out whether or not they'll get the VIN number, the mileage, and they'll tell you whether it's a free replacement. What can ruin a catalytic converter? Running your engine with a check engine light on continually will do it. A lot of nasty stuff in your gasoline, unwanted or unused uh, additives, something old that you've poured in uh, the gasoline could contaminate the, the converter as well. And long-term usage can do, can do it as well. So it, anyway, it's guaranteed under emission part of your car. It's got a much longer guarantee than the normal three-year 36,000 mile warranty. So if it's condemned, if your mechanic condemns it, check with the new car dealer to see if it's guaranteed. Got it? All right. Now, back up. We're still showing you this uh, uh, long-running uh, show that's showing you the orphan cars. And same thing as the electric fuel pump. None of these cars have catalytic converters. None of them. And uh, Let's go back up and see if maybe some of these cars should have had a converter on them. Watch. We've got a whole string of Edsels here, and we're going to run them through together, guys. I'm just going to walk up the line and tell you what's here, and then you can tell the folks about the cars. This is a 58 Citation four-door. This is Dennis Majors from Monroe, Michigan. This next one looks like a, a 59. Where's your name tag, sir? This is a 59. This is a Ranger four-door. This is Dale Milliman, Jr., Dan Linda, from Ypsilanti, Michigan. This beautiful turquoise is a 59, and I'm cheating because I'm looking at the license plate. And this is David Truix from Canton. Beautiful oh, wow. car, David. This next one is an Edsel 59 Villager uh, station wagon. This is Jeff White from Wyandotte. Behind Jeff, we've got a gorgeous, absolutely gorgeous red 59 Corsair convertible. This is Ron Nichols from Plymouth, Michigan. And the last one in the string of Edsels is a 1959 Ranger four-door. This is uh, Bill, Bill White. Leach from Wald Lake, Michigan. Gentlemen? Well, one thing for sure we can say about these Edsels, the first Edsel is, is, is different from the other ones, and the first Edsel is built off a of mercury shell. Isn't that right, uh, Jim? That's correct. Uh, when, when Edsel started out, they were going to bracket mercury. They were going to be a level above the Ford with the mercury in the center, and then more Edsels, and then Lincoln. Now, didn't quite work out that way, and of course, the large Edsels of which the Corsair, the Citation was the top of the line, were built only one year. Uh, following that, there were two levels of cars built in 59. Both with Ford bodies, right? Ford bodies. This is a 1930 DeSoto. Um, this is uh, Wayne Newman from Clio, Michigan. This is a CK RHD Roadster. Again, the class is Orphans of the Big Three, and it's certainly uh, the DeSoto. Uh, was which was built, built by Chrysler Corporation. It uh, was introduced in 1928. It was one of the, 28 was a big year for Chrysler. They introduced the Plymouth, the DeSoto, uh, the Fargo line of commercial vehicles. They bought Dodge Brothers and built their big engineering building in Highland Park. Uh, in 1929, DeSoto was the, set a record for the most number of new cars sold uh, for a for first year, uh, a makes first year production. Uh, they broke a record set by Chrysler in 1924, Pontiac in 1926, Graham Page in 28, and DeSoto in 29, and the record was not bested until the Ford Falcon uh, bested DeSoto's record in 1960, the year that DeSoto was discontinued with its 61 model. This is one of those DeSotos where you were supposed to go down to your dealership and say, Hi, Groucho sent me. Of course, DeSoto Plymouth was the sponsor of uh, You Bet Your Life with Groucho Marx. Uh, Chrysler um, was known in this era for some very conservative styling. Uh, this is a 1953 uh, DeSoto, which had a new body, but still had the, the rear fender bulge and some of the um, some of the characteristics of the of the previous DeSotos. It has, the, of course, the DeSoto characteristic uh, tooth grill, and uh, the the V8 engine there. This is a Hemi V8, isn't that right, uh, James? That's right. It was the uh, the Hemi original Chrysler Hemi family had. Uh, 
three different distinct engines, one for Chrysler, one for DeSoto, one for Dodge. This one was a 276 cubic inches and 160 horsepower, uh, both in the 53 and the 52 model that uh, was the first of the fire domes. Okay, George, bring on the next contestant. Yes, let's bring, <laughs> let's bring up both these uh, 56s, uh, Ron. There's a 56. Uh, I got you, Kevin. Coming. Come right up here, sir. Don't be shy. We don't hurt anybody in Ypsilanti. Where's your name tag? Yeah, right. What is your name, sir? Henry Clemens, Westland, Michigan. And what year is your DeSoto? 1956. It's beautiful. And we've got another 56 coming up right behind Henry's. This man does have his name tag. God love him. This is a Fire Dome Seville four-door, and this is Bob and Kay Justice from Kalamazoo. Guys? Well, the, this is, these are the DeSotos of the forward look era. Uh, in 1949, Chrysler hired a Studebaker designer, Virgil Exner, to come into Chrysler and to pep up their styling. Uh, the 1955 line and 56 lines were the first uh, time, first uh, uh, production cars that Virgil Exner did uh, for Chrysler. Uh, these uh, DeSotos featured a uh, wraparound windshield that was different from what from that was used in the competition. Notice the windshield posts slant backwards instead of being vertical, thus avoiding the knee knockers when you. Uh, uh, got in and out of the car. Uh, 1956 was the first year for the DeSoto fins and for the fir first year for the famed uh, triple tail lights, which uh, the styling theme that lasted clear until in into 1960. This next one is a 1957 DeSoto. This is a Fire Dome four door. This is Edward Wilson from Wauseon, Ohio. That's the hometown of Barney Oldfield, for those of you who don't know it. <laughs> Uh, that 1957 DeSoto that's leaving us, you can see the triple tail lights that were the continuation from the theme of 1956. You know, when we talk about highway safety, we always seem to, to gravitate to tires. Which are the most important safety item on your automobile or truck? But you know what the second most important safety item on your automobile is? Wiper blades, windshield wiper blades. And we feature this particular blade. It's called the Rain Eater. And uh, you can find out all the information about the Rain Eater at www.raineater.com. It's a wiper blade that my friend Lance Thornton from uh, upstate New York uh, sells. And I feature it on my show because it's my favorite and I have them on my automobile. Why is it my favorite? Because this Rain Eater is frameless no frame. Here's why frameless is good, is they hold to the windshield because of the design, the middle part design, they hold to the windshield, and secondly, because of no frame, especially in the winter time, there's no place for the slush, ice, and snow to gather, so they work like a snow blade. And then finally, the rain eater is uh, outlast all of the other competition almost by a third. So again, find out more about the Rain Eater at www.raineater.com and you can find out where you can buy this wonderful blade. Now, they did not have frameless, even some cars didn't have wiper blades on the old cars at Ypsilanti and that's what we've been showing you. So let's jump back up in the car drive up north to Michigan and visit the Orphan Show. Uh, the 57 DeSoto was very distinctive in that the bumper was above the grill. You get a chance to look at that car, you can see that the oval bumper is above the grill. Very distinctive. This next car is a 61 DeSoto. Uh, the gentleman that owns it is Rick Reshe from Ann Arbor. This car was purchased from the Naylor family of Naylor Chrysler Plymouth in Ann Arbor. This is a 50,000 mile original DeSoto. And this, unfortunately, was the end of, end of DeSoto production. Um, uh, in 1961, when they introduced the new DeSoto, all was available was a two-door hardtop and a four-door hardtop. Uh, Chrysler Corporation was building two other similar cars with similar engines in 1961. One was the uh, Dodge Polara sedan, and the other was the, um, was the Chrysler Newport, which was a new series for Chrysler in 1961. Unfortunately, of the DeSoto, the Dodge, and the Chrysler, the Chrysler Newport was the least expensive, and so people naturally went for the Chrysler. 
and the DeSoto was phased out. The announcement was made, I believe, uh, in November 25th, 19, 1960, that they were going to be phasing out the production of the DeSoto, and uh, the, the car was out of production before the 61 calendar year arrived. <laughs> this is absolutely a spectacular old Imperial limousine. Uh, they might be here to take you away on this one way if you keep this up. But, uh, sir, may I have your name card, please? This particular car is a Crown Imperial limousine, and this is Wayne Simonson from Ray, Michigan. Yes, this is, a, um, this is one of 127 manufactured at uh, Jefferson Assembly. Uh, the uh, Crown Imperials were all new for 1955, along with the regular Imperials. Notice the distinctive box check grill that was later used on the Chrysler 300. Notice the gun sight or microphone taillights. This was, uh, this was the creme de la creme, creme in 1955. Of course, the uh, uh, Cadillac was building a limousine, but unfortunately Packard and Lincoln weren't. So these were the Cadillac and Imperial were the two limousines that, that uh, you could choose from in 1955. This car was continued for 1956 with styling alterations, and then Chrysler decided that it was, it was uh, too expensive to build here in the United States, and the next Crown Imperial limousines after the 56 model were built by Ghia in Italy. This one is a 60 Imperial Crown. This is Peter Rock from Gros Eel, Michigan. Gorgeous car, Peter. Don't move. Just stay where you're at. <laughs> this next one, and you don't have your window tag, so who are you, sir? Mark Nowry. Where are you from? Dearborn. Mark is from Dearborn. What year is your car, sir? 1964. A 64. And what color do they call this shade of turquoise? Silver turquoise. How about that? Beautiful car. This next one is also a Crown Imperial convertible. This is a 65. This is Jerry and Carol Lacey from Midland. And this gorgeous red convertible is a 66. This is also a Crown Imperial, and this is Wayne Jorgensen from Batavia, Illinois. Gentlemen? You might want to say that Imperial was registered as a separate make by Chrysler from 1955 through 1970. After 1970, it was a Chrysler Imperial again. This one here is a Meadowbrook winner. This has 11,000 miles on it. This is a 1957, and this is uh, Duran and Joyce. Pronounce your last name for me, sir. Yazijan. If you say so. It's a gorgeous <laughs> car. It's absolutely gorgeous. And here's our friend Joe Kelly sneaking in with another car. Joe never gets tired of showing people his cars, if in case you don't notice. This is a Crown Southampton four-door. And again, this is Joe Kelly from Whispering Pines. And I understand this is a 7,000-mile car, Joe. Is that correct? It's 100% original. We've come a long way from Crown Imperials to the, this little station wagon, but this is a Valiant. And I don't know what year it is because the name tag's not in the window. It's a 60. And where are you from, sir? Livonia. And what is your name? Dave Clevenger. Hold your car still there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, now everybody's going to ask, well, what, what's a Valiant doing here? Well, the reason this, this particular Valiant is eligible for the Orphan Car Show is because in 1960 and 1960 only, the Valiant was a separate make of car. It was not a Plymouth. It became a Plymouth Valiant in 1961. But in 1960, it was a Valiant, and, and it, was, it was designed to, um, the, the advertising slogan was, Nobody's Kid Brother. So it was specifically designed so it didn't look like any other Chrysler Corporation car. It didn't look like a, like a, a downsized Plymouth the way the, the Falcon looked like a downsized Ford. Uh, it was a very distinctively styled car. It had a lot of the uh, Exner cues, including the, um, the uh, radiator grill and the very sculpted body size. Uh -huh. 